Hey, Mike, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, awesome. Well, sorry about that. I think there were some technical issues while I was getting started. Was I was I there or was I frozen? <laughs> yeah, you, you were frozen for about 30 seconds and then it was just me. And I was like, oh man, I really hope I'm not hosting this thing. <laughs> you gotta do the interview yourself now, Mike. <laughs> I know, yeah. I was a little bit scared awesome. for a second. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining us today. And thank you especially to Mike. Um, Today, we're doing a welcome uh, our YouTube live with Mike, who's a recent admit to you Chicago booth to talk about his impressive GMAT and MBA application journey. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions you have for Mike, uh, please put them in the chat or the comment box. We will cover them after the interview so that we don't have to stop, you know, kind of the flow of today's session. Um, great. So, Michael, thank you. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we would love to, you know, kind of learn a little bit about yourself. Can you please share an introduction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, just for background in terms of where I'm from, from Seattle, Washington, pretty much grew up in the state of Washington, that area my whole life, um, went across the state uh, for college, Gonzaga University, um, accounting and finance major, um, kind of started out in the whole um, accounting industry, got my CPA right out of college, um, kind of worked in audit for three and a half years transferred over to Deloitte doing data analytics consulting now. Um, and yeah, I ended up uh, deciding that I wanted to pursue this path, um, I would say, uh, quite a bit before actually I even transitioned into Deloitte, probably about two years out of school. I was thinking about the MBA, um, but then didn't really start to pursue it until um, probably a year and a half after that. Um, and yeah, we can get into some more nuances um, of the background and in, in, in my life later, but I'll leave it at that for now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure the viewers would love to hear more about your kind of application journey and, and career goals. Um, before we dive into that, we'd love to dedicate, you know, some time to understanding more about your GMAT journey. So I understand that was challenging, sure. but ultimately a very successful journey. Um, can you share a little bit about how your GMAT preparation journey started, what the initial few weeks were like, your prep strategy, materials you used? Um, we'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think so. Like right off the bat, I just didn't really know a whole lot about the test. And so I said, okay, let me just do a lot of research and kind of how do I get like a pretty good baseline um, for just, you know, the different question types, topics, and then and then kind of figure out where my strengths and weaknesses are and go from there. And so the first thing that I decided to do is just kind of look at who are the top players in the test prep game, um, you know, and kind of just go with that, you know, their quant books, their verbal books, do a full, full uh, fledged overview. I ended up going with Manhattan. I can't really speak to any of the other companies or, you know, who's, who's good or bad or, 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 you know, what the differential is there. But my game plan was, you know, get the Manhattan uh, quant book, the verbal book. And I also saw they had the advanced quant book. Um, so I just bought that anyways, um, just because it was heavily promoted. And, and, and so I said, let me get through those um, within three months um, and really take really good notes of, over those, make sure that I really understand that. And I said, I think given, you know, my somewhat busy job, I can kind of make that happen. Um, and so for me, it was really, I targeted like goals of when I wanted to finish the books by to keep myself on track. So maybe it was, you know, finish the first book within, you know, four weeks or whatever, the second book within another four weeks, so on and so forth, uh, with the ultimate plan of taking a practice test right after um, finishing like the core material and then doing like a full fledged assessment of everything and going from there. So that's kind of how it, it, the first, like, let's say, you know, three months or so started. 
Awesome. And I'm sure a lot of the folks who might be studying for the GMAT now are trying to do it on top of like a busy work schedule. Can you talk a little bit more about how you were able to balance that? I know you mentioned you were doing both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think honestly, that was easily the toughest part about the process because with the GMAT, I learned it's so much more about consistency than anything else. Like it's not like, so I, you know, ended up um, taking four CPA exams and actually two CFA exams. So like no, no stranger to butts and seats sitting down for standardized tests. Um, but those were all heavy content based exams. So I could put in four hours one day, you know, zero hours, zero hours, you know, and then four hours another day, right? Kind of like really spread it out based on my schedule um, because I'm just accruing content. But then I realized the GMAT's just not really like that at all. I mean, there's certain strategies that, you know, you can kind of pick up over time, but it really pays dividends to kind of be in the zone, let's call it, and kind of be in that headspace to where you're really privy to the little tips and tricks of the exam and really to be in the best headspace for that. Um, you need to be very consistent and do it every single day if you want maximum results, um, at least that's my opinion. And so um, I found that it, it, it was like, for me, it was just mornings. I was like, I don't know what my job's really going to be doing like later in the day. Maybe it's going to keep me up late into the evening. Maybe I'm going to have a lot of time later, but at a minimum, I just made sure that I had, you know, hour and a half even just in the morning so that regardless of whatever else happened, I was hitting that that ended up being a really good strategy for me for a lot of reasons. Awesome. Well, I think you touched upon this a little bit already, um, mm -hmm. but in terms of, you know, kind of how you worked on your strengths and weaknesses, can you share a little bit more about your learning from your analysis, your error logs? Um, you know, if you took the test more than once, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I saw, I saw I got a comment here to uh, speak a little bit slower. So happy to do that. Um, for analysis and error logs. Yeah, I think that was the biggest thing that I was very disorganized with when I first started. Um, I, you know, was kind of tracking things very loosely within OneNote. Um, and at first I, you know, was basically just tracking every single thing that I got wrong, not really organizing things by subtopics, like really all over the board. Um, and then when you first start, obviously there's so much that you don't know. And so your air log grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And if you're not very organized with that, it's very very, very, very difficult. Um, and so I would not recommend, or I would highly recommend being um, very aware that you need to be organized with your air log. And I would just recommend for anyone starting the process, really just doing that by subtopic, right? So, you know, sentence correction, reading comprehension, et cetera. Um, with quant, it could be a little bit more nuanced than that because um, quant's pretty broad with problem solving and data sufficiency. But I think, you know, to go back to the question, it's, it was really a matter of starting very disorganized with the air log and then just getting a lot more organized over time. Um, yeah, and I can get into some other thoughts about that later. But. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and then I think for error logs, we've heard kind of different methods. I think you mentioned organizing it by subtopic. How, did you ever track, you know, kind of the types of errors in the sense of like, I didn't read the question very thoroughly, or I, you know, took a guess or like something like that? Did you kind of take note of those type of errors as well? Or is it mostly like the content? That is a really good question. Um, I think later in the game, um, I ended up realizing that, wow, I'm not getting a lot of these questions wrong because I don't know the content. It's literally because I am just grazing over something in the question incorrectly. And I think we all think as we're going through the test, it's like, oh, you know, I don't know how to do the super overlap. I don't know how to do the super complicated overlapping sets, you know, concept. I have to go and grind this really weird nuanced concept. It really ended up not being about that when I made my big leaps and bounds. It ended up being so much more about taking that extra time to reread every question, make sure I'm understanding every single thing crystal clear on what's going on. And that ended up helping me pick up a lot of points that I was dropping before by just straight up trying to rush and just not really like understanding the question initially correctly. I could not recommend that enough. That, that is the most 
under understated thing, you know, or, or, or um, what am I saying? Um, yeah, uh, underrated, excuse me, thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a common problem that people struggle with, not so much yeah. the content always, but how they approach the problem. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, diving a little bit further into the GMAT, um, would love to learn more about, you know, kind of your experience with the quant section, and we'll go to the verbal section shortly after. Um, kind of what you were starting with, how you managed to increase it. Um, is there particular particular tips or tricks that you would recommend someone who might be struggling with it? Um, would love to learn more about your specific experience with the GMAT. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I would say like from a quant perspective, I'm probably not going to be the best example of someone who struggled big time with quant just because of that like everyone has their like natural abilities and, and their weaknesses. For me, it was just crystal clear. My natural ability, you know, pretty much since I was born was quant and coming into this test and even growing up, my weakness was verbal. And so for me, getting up into that 47 to 49 range for quant all things considered happened relatively quickly for me. Um, what I will say was a huge game changer, and I learned this through um, working with a, actually a private one-on-one -on -one tutor, was I didn't realize how crucial the concept of skipping is in quant. Because before that, I was maybe, you know, kind of in that whatever 45, you know, to 47 range. Um, and then I was struggling with time a little bit on the actual test. And then my tutor said, he said, you, you know, you know that you, you don't exercise skipping whatsoever on the exam. Why don't you do that? And I said, you can just skip questions and you can still score highly. And he says, especially on quant. Yes, you can absolutely do that. And so as soon as I could basically realize, oh, I can just skip, you know, however many two, three, sometimes even four questions on the actual exam that I just A, don't know, and B, know are going to be a huge time suck. That ended up completely being a game changer for me from an execution standpoint, because then I realized I can just, I can just not waste time on questions I know I'm probably going to get wrong and then spend all my time on the questions I know I can knock down and I have a high level of accuracy in those. I would say that strategy shift more than sort of technical advice ended up pulling my quant score up quite a bit specifically. Absolutely. No, that's definitely yeah. very helpful uh, to, to understand. Um, to clarify, when you say skip, do you mean like guess and move on or just leave it blank altogether? What was your experience with, with that kind of strategy change? No, that's that's yeah, a fair clarification. I, when I say skip and I'll be crystal clear, I mean, I read the question. I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. And I know I don't know how to do this. Straight up C next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. because I'm like, I, I, I want that time like that time is yeah. so key. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, well, then kind of moving over to, I'm sure um, would be more interesting for you to talk about would be around the verbal section, which you mentioned you had struggled a little bit more with rather than quant. Um, how did yeah. you go, you know, go about kind of improving that area of the test, your experience with the verbal section? Oh my gosh. Yeah. The, the verbal section was definitely tough right off the bat. I, and, and I knew, you know, it, it wasn't even a matter of, oh, am I having a good day? Am I having a bad day? It just was not there. And, and specifically the thing that just was not clicking was, was sentence correction for me. That was probably my, for whatever reason, my single biggest kryptonite, I could not get that straight. Um, and so that just took a lot of time, quite frankly, and a lot of just grinding different questions, really understanding um, why I was getting things wrong. At first, I was just going through and just doing a lot of different questions from a lot of di uh, from like a lot of different test prep companies. The number one thing that I could recommend to anybody uh, for the verbal section and more specifically to sentence correction is only do GMAT official guide questions, do zero other GMAT official guide questions, because there are very, very specific things that GMAT tests as it relates to sentence correction. And you don't want to have to learn other people's tricks, other things that maybe Manhattan, Veritas, you know, Magoosh, you name it, right, are, are testing. You want to know the very specific tricks, tips and tricks that GMAC is testing. And then once you realize what those are, you will be in a very, very, very good position to succeed on those questions. Right. Absolutely. 
Yeah, definitely in terms of um, verbal, it's important to, to think about the who created the test and what they're testing for. I know the GMAT is very Absolutely. specific about what they're asking for. Um, I remember like some of the two answers, like they would, you would narrow it down to two answers and they both seemed right. So definitely hear you on the sentence correction <laughs> aspect. It's difficult. Um, awesome. So uh, we'd love to learn more about, you know, kind of your final prep um, right before, I guess, I think you mentioned you might, may have taken the test more than once. Can you talk a little bit more about your, you know, your recommended prep strategy for, you know, the final two weeks, the final days before, um, the big day, the big D day, uh, can you share a little bit more about yeah. your experience and, and any tips around that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think kind of leading into that question, I think the number one thing that everyone needs to realize, like when they're studying for the GMAT is, is you have to ask yourself the question when you sit down to study, you say, am I studying because I want to learn more content? Or am I studying to get better at actually taking the GMAT? And those are very different things. Because on one end of the spectrum, when you're trying to learn new concepts, you might sit down, do five questions and spend, you know, half an hour on those five questions because you're trying to learn different concepts, things that you don't know. And then kind of on the other end of the coin, on the execution end, you say, I'm sitting down, I'm putting a timer next to my desk and I'm doing time sets on questions to practice for the actual test day environment. Nothing to do with actually learning how to get problems right or wrong. How do I put myself under that actual pressure of the clock on the exam and figure out what what sort of decisions do I need to make when I maybe don't know the answer, when I maybe know that I've been taking too long on a problem and kind of understanding how you mentally deal with that pressure is really, really, really key before you just throw yourself into that environment on exam day. So for me, leading up like two weeks before, it was all about that execution side and just telling myself, I'm not learning anything new. I'm just maximizing my potential that I currently have with what I actually know. And so I was doing a ton of time sets. I would basically line up in a book you know, 20 quant problems and just put myself under a timer and just go. I would do the same thing with verbal, kind of do a different mix of problems, reading comprehension, sentence correction, critical reasoning, and just do time sets and just go and just be very comfortable under that high time pressure environment. And that helped me, you know, gain a lot of confidence when I was actually in the exam um, in terms of what I should be doing in a time setting. Right. Can you share a little bit, um, or if you have any experience with kind of like testing, prep test fatigue? I've heard that, you know, you don't want to do a full exam right before, the day before the exam, the actual totally. test. Um, did you experience that at all? Do you have any like tips around it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know I've you know, asked so many people about this and <laughs> read all the forums and stuff about this. And I, I, I honestly experimented with a few different things with that. Um, I, I'm confident in saying I would not recommend taking an exam the day before. Um, so I'm, I'm confident in that piece. But I also think in terms of the just do nothing the day before, for me, it's different for different people. That stressed me out. I, I tried that actually for, for a real exam. I really didn't like that personally. And on that token, it's all about what puts you in a good headspace. Do you feel comfortable doing nothing the day before? If so, do nothing the day before. If that stresses you out, even the idea of that to look at zero GMAT material, to me it did, don't do that. Like go and just flip through your notes, do a few questions. It's all about what puts you in a good headspace. The biggest risk you run with doing a lot of prep and time sets and crazy things the day before is having maybe a streak of questions that you, know, you are not very good at. You don't do very well on those questions and then you start to doubt yourself and then you lose a little bit of confidence. You just don't want to ruin your confidence the day before. So yeah. you want to mitigate that risk. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. So um, I think right before we switch into kind of the more uh, the section about learning more about your career goals and, and booth for you, um, can you share any like last tips or advice, you know, in taking the GMAT for anyone who's preparing for it now or planning to take it in the future? Yeah, yeah, I would just say, um, you know, it's really all about pushing through those barriers, whatever that means for you. Like, I think we were talking before, Stacey, about how, you know, I, I ended up scoring 
a 720 um, in practice pretty early on. I think it was around the maybe four and a half month mark of my prep. And I was feeling really good about that. And I was thinking, man, you know, I can go up here and really just start to rack up some high scores. You know, I can only go up from 720. And then I ended up scoring three 660s in practice in a row. And for me, that was probably rock bottom of the whole process. And I just had to take a big step back and say, am I either going to accept that I can't get higher or am I just going to double down and just go nuts and say, no, I'm, 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 re, I'm getting back to the 700s and I'm going to score a high score. And I ended up going the latter route. And for me, it was just all about finding you got to find your biggest weakness and you just have to absolutely hammer it. And for me, as I mentioned, that was sentence correction. And I just took the psychopath of doing every single sentence correction problem that GMAT Club has to offer and just keeping a monster error log on that and then just turning that weakness into a strength. And now that's something that was definitively my biggest weakness. And now it's potentially my best section of all of the five sections, including one. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Mike. I'm sure it's helpful for the folks who are yeah. listening and um, who are struggling with the GMAT or planning to take it soon. Um, awesome. I'd love to shift more into understanding, you know, kind of more about your MBA application experience. Um, so firstly, would love to learn more about, you know, your, your choice, Booth. You know, what about the culture or the program attracted you? Um, how did you decide to apply there? Uh, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be really honest in terms of like what my mentality was coming into the application process. Um, For me, it was all about how do I put myself in the best position to take a crack at some of these top strategy side consulting firms. Um, And I sort of just looked at the universities based on their employment reports that were placing a lot of people specifically into consulting uh, that were in that sort of top 10, top 15 range. Um, And so then from there, I I initially made the mistake of trying to just apply to like 10 schools because I thought that, you know, the more schools you apply to, the higher probability you have of getting into one of them. Quickly realized that, um, oh, wow, surprise, surprise, it's a lot of work to apply to these schools. And the quality of my applications were diminishing as I tried to sort of take on too many. And so how I ended up, <clears throat> excuse me, personally narrowing down my list was what schools of the top are placing a lot of people into consulting specifically? And then what is the letter of recommendation crossover from a prompt perspective, actually? Because I didn't want to ask my recommenders to be having to write to seven different prompts. That's something I would highly recommend uh, anyone look into unless you have multiple, multiple different letter of recommendation writers on deck (laughs) or very generous letter of recommendation (laughs) writers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's definitely very different from, you know, some of the undergrad experiences where you could just write one common app that would go to all the schools. Each school has their own application portal and application form and essays. So it's definitely a very time consuming process. So you want to be selective about the the programs you're applying to. Um, Awesome. um, well, what we would love to learn more about is, you know, you, I think you touched upon it when you introduced yourself, but your kind of your career goals at the time um, and then how they shifted from, you know, more of the finance perspective or, or area to, to management consulting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I was at PwC and audit, you know, about a year into audit. I was kind of thinking, OK, what do I want to do next? Kind of what, what's what's that really next hill that I want to climb? Initially, I thought that that was um, kind of getting into the investment banking equity research, you know, kind of one of the two of those very specific sectors. And so um, I ended up having a, a colleague of mine who was pursuing the, the CFA. This is after I had finished my CPA. And uh, I saw that, you know, he was just on a really good trajectory, um, ended up being somewhat of an idol early on in my career. And so I was kind of picking his brain. OK, you know, do I want to do this? And ended up deciding, yes, I do go down that CFA path do the first couple levels of the CFA, um, which is quite a bit more difficult than the CPA, by the way. Um, It is a massive commitment. And then um, right as I was doing studying for level two um, and kind of facing some challenges throughout that, I asked myself, do I really want to do this? Like, do I really want to be in investment banking? Because if I want to push myself to, you know, kind of finish out this process and pursue that lifestyle, I better have a really confident answer to that question. 
and I, I I ended up coming to the conclusion, no, I do not, um, because and then and then the next question is, what do I want to pursue instead? Ended up landing on management consulting, and from there, just basically looked up what are the top players in the game, found the big three, and then ended up just deciding I'm just going to pursue that with everything I have, um, and that's really where where we're at today. Un unwavered from, I think that decision was made in uh, late 2018. Wow. Yeah, it's been quite a long journey for you. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has. Awesome. Um, I think an interesting question would be, you know, throughout the application process, can you share a little bit about anything that was, or maybe the most surprising to you or even more cha most challenging? Um, would love to learn more about that through your process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I started the application process. And what, when I say application process, I mean, we have to take the GMAT. Let's deal with that first before everything else. I started that in January of 2021 with the first thought that I'm going to apply round one in September, late September. I figured that that timeline was plenty enough time. Going back, the biggest thing that I regret was having my GMAT overlap with the rest of the application. That sort of overlap period was very stressful, ended up definitely negatively impacting my GMAT and applications during that time, and ultimately ended up pushing all of my applications to round two. So for anyone, I guess, that's listening, my biggest recommendation was if you're even thinking about pursuing grad school, your GMAT lasts for five years. It's going to pay dividends if you just get on that, treat that completely separately from the rest of the application so that you can get your score, figure out kind of where you're at with that, and then just completely address the rest of the application process separately. Um, some people might be able to do it overlap. I'm not saying that's impossible, but I would not recommend it. Yeah, I definitely second that. I had the similar experience where I ended up applying, was planning on applying round one. GMAT took a little longer than expected. I applied round two to most of the programs. So absolutely GMAT <laughs> or testing, whatever test you plan to take, try to get it out of the way first. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, I think we would love to learn more about your interview experience. So it's my understanding that Booth does alumni interviews. Can you share a little bit more about, you know, after you, you submit the application, you went through the process, you got an interview. Awesome. Um, how did you prepare that? Like, what was the alumni interview experience like? Um, can you share more about that? Yeah, no, I think that that's a really good question. I, you know, how I approach the interview process is, okay, so the, the story that I was going with on my application was, pretty nuanced, um, you know, it's very detailed, very involved. I think the number one thing that I thought is, how do I communicate what I'm doing and why Booth in a very concise manner? I don't want to just be rambling. I don't want to confuse my interviewer. I want my interview to, interviewer to feel confident that I know exactly why I want to go to Booth and I know exactly what I want to do. And that was something that I, I worked on a lot, just iterating through what those stories were going to be before coming to the actual interview. Aside from the my story piece, I just researched the crap out of Booth itself. I looked at all the classes. I looked at when the classes were taught. I looked at the teachers. I looked at the teachers' backgrounds. I looked at all of these different things. And I, you know, to provide you a little insight into the interview, I specifically remember my interviewer, he said, you know, why Booth? And so I'm rambling on all these things. And I, and I made the comment after I said, honestly, I, I, I could go on, but I, I don't want to keep rambling. And the interviewer kind of calls my bluff a little bit and says, oh, no, please do keep going. Um, you know, as though maybe I didn't have any, any more to say. He's almost calling the bluff a little bit. And um, I just had so many things on deck ready to go. And I just go, oh, yeah, I want to take this class with this teacher. Just boom, 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 boom down the line and received an immediate reaction of, oh, wow, you've done a lot of research. And so that, I think, was definitely a very positive affirmation that the interviewer gained confidence that this wasn't just a check the box application for me. The research had been done. And I think that ended up definitely heavily contributing that specific moment, actually, even um, to the ultimate acceptance. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of schools have interviews to to really also not only understand your fit, but your passion and your uh, interest in the program. So make every school right. think that if, even if they, I mean, hopefully they are, but even if they're not, think that they're your number one dream school is, is the advice. So absolutely second that. Awesome. Um, 
So I think the last question is just more around, I want to understand a little bit more about you. You shared that you did a lot of research on Booth. Um, do you think there's anything particularly useful that you did that you would recommend, whether it's to the website, more niche things like, I don't know, club websites or course, course details? Um, do you have any recommendations on how someone might want to go about conducting that research when they're you know either planning on applying or before the interview? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I asked myself that same question, you know, kind of like, what's the, what's the best way to come into that interview and prepare and, you know, learn about the university? And really, the answer I found is through the website. And, and, and the reason the Booth website to be specific. The reason that I say that is because Booth is going to advertise in their website what they're interested in right? Like kind of what angle they're coming at it from. And then they also have all the access to the different class um, scheduling and repositories and stuff like that, which at least for Booth specifically is quite extensive. You can see literally all of the classes that are offered to the MBA students and the teachers that taught them and bios associated with those teachers and pretty extensive descriptions on those classes as well. And so it's really all about kind of crafting your story around the information available to you on the website. And yeah, I think digging into the, those course details is, uh, I, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's going to help you stand out. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think our last question before we move over to the live comments and live questions is just sure. if you have any um, advice, your best advice to someone who's currently considering applying to an MBA program or maybe starting the process and taking the GMAT, any best like wise words uh, that you'd like to share before they, <laughs> you know, kind of get themselves into that process? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I would say high level, just the number one thing that I that I would say is do not come into the process with a oh I'm just want to get my toes wet you know oh I maybe want to pursue this you know like you have to come in 100% this is what I'm doing I'm willing to ride out the peaks and valleys all the above and just kind of coming to it with that just straight nose kind of head down perspective because there's going to be times whether it be the GMAT or the application where you're going to say wow this is maybe too much um you know the numbers are stacked against me right you can it's very easy to get down on yourself throughout the process um but having that strong level of commitment which is usually driven by you know kind of the back end goal um i i could not recommend that enough and if you don't have that um i, I would not recommend starting to pursue the process yes absolutely i think a lot of people might be, you know, mildly interested in an in MBA, like start the process. They don't realize how much commitment right. and, and ups and downs as you've experienced definitely happens throughout the process. So you definitely need commitment that you're interested in, in pursuing the, the degree. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, right. thanks so much, Mike. Um, I, I think right now yeah. would be a great time to move over to the live comments. Um, sure. As a reminder for everyone who's watching, if you have any comments that you have for Mike, you know, about anything that we discussed today, the GMAT, his application process booth, um, please feel free to put those in the chat. We'll be covering those right now. Um, so let me see. So I think the first question, oops, I think I still have an old banner up. I think one of the first questions that we have um, is just around, I think more tactically, like how many hours you are spending every day to, to achieve your final score. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So kind of going back to that, you know, beginning of the process when I talked about just, you know, basically getting through the Manhattan test prep books initially, um, I would say probably around three hours on average a day, maybe some might have been one or two, maybe some might have been five or something like that, right? But kind of just making sure the consistency once again was was the really key piece with that. I had that baseline, as I mentioned, of an hour and a half, and then kind of just trying to, oh, do I have extra time after work? Um, I'm just going to basically hit that as much as I can, schedule permitting. Um, but yeah, kind of right around that three hours a day range and then when it came to kind of prepping more for the test i think to the extent that you can put some big time like weekend hours in if you are this is coming from the perspective of someone working a job that's really going to help you chip away um a lot um it, it, and it will pay dividends especially early on absolutely um the next question that I think would be interesting um, for you to share a little bit more about is if you plan to, I don't know if it's called major uh, at Booth, you concentrate what you're planning to study to pursue management consulting. Is there anything specific that stood out to you or that you plan to take advantage of? 
Yeah, I think for me, um, like, yeah, you you can kind of drill into some subtopic. It's not necessarily a major um, within Booth, but it's kind of playing to my existing strengths, which, you know, I'm coming from data analytics consulting. And so I kind of want to double down on that and kind of develop that sort of niche. And so I'm taking business analytics. And then there's also the strategy component that you can focus on too, um, which is pretty common for people pursuing strategy side consulting. Um, and so, so really kind of just drilling into those specific uh, concentrations and and then the associated classes um, that, that, that can help you increase your skills in those areas. Absolutely. Great. And I think um, the same person had a question. I think you mentioned you were, you know, kind of a strength was in the quant section. Um, I think they wanted to learn more about your background. Um, can you share your major from undergrad? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think the connection was, was a little spotty there. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Did you hear that question? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. So my major from undergrad, um, accounting and finance double major. Um, or yeah, so two majors, I guess, from undergrad. Awesome. Um, great. I think we've got some similar questions. So just getting through these. Okay. Uh, I think this is a really good one. Um, can you share more about if you had a new mentors through the mentor or mentors through the application process, how you went about finding them, who you tapped on? Um, could you share more about that? I'm sure a lot of folks are, are kind of wondering that same question as they go through the process now. Yeah, Mike, yeah. Can... Um, in just a second, the connection is a little bit shoddy here. Um, I'm hot. I, unfortunately, I'm moving. And so I had to pack up the Wi-Fi, and so I have to hotspot through a phone. Give me just a moment here. Oh, no worries. Hey, Amanda, uh, can you bring your phone a little bit closer? All right, thank you. Can, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. OK, awesome. Um, so yeah, mentor throughout the process. To be honest, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of different mentors and like you know, my different pursuits of, of these different hills I've decided to climb throughout life. I honestly didn't really have that very much um, throughout this process. And I would say the closest thing that I ended up having to that was uh, my, my GMAT tutor um, that I ended up going with. And he, he ended up really providing me with a lot of perspective on the process and just really key insights throughout. But I would say to the extent you can find someone that is going through the process as you are, um, I would highly recommend that. I honestly wish that I had that a little bit more. Um, a lot of people have since reached out to me that I know, like friends. I was kind of the first of, you know, let's call it my friends or colleagues to start pursuing this route. Um, and since then, a lot of people have reached out to me for advice. So I kind of, I hope to be that person for other people, but um, it does um, help to have a lot of those initial questions answered. So didn't really have that myself, would recommend trying to find that for, for others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think another question, this is an interesting one. Um, I, I know you mentioned a lot about doing research, you know, kind of on the website, diving deep into that. Did you have a chance to talk to any alums from the schools you're applying to or booth um, that helped with the process? Um, and kind of what was that experience like for you? Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely did. And, and it was a really good experience. I think on booth, they have this sort of listing of people, if, and you can find this through their website, where um, you have first year students that essentially sign up to, you know, answer questions from prospective people applying to the program. And so you can sign in through a portal effectively through open time slots. It's very automated um, to, to, to sync up with someone. Um, and you can even filter by people that have similar um, progressions or they're, they're in clubs. Like it's very detailed. You could say, I want someone that are in all of these clubs, you know, that has this background, that's in this industry, it's very well built out. And so I leveraged that resource throughout Booth, found someone who is pursuing, who is actively in actually a lot of the clubs that I wanted to learn more about for purposes of speaking to them in my application. And I did that with a couple different people at Booth. Um, and it was very interesting, very insightful, and ended up um, helping me speak to those areas, not only within my essays, but also in the interview with just a lot more confidence. Um, so I, I would highly recommend 
that route, you can learn probably more doing that than you can just scrolling through the website, honestly. So would highly recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I don't think there's any other, oops, let's see. Do you think the career path is perhaps different? Um, oh, I think someone's asking about, you know, if you are speaking to alums, you're reaching out to people and let's say you're interested in management consulting, but you know, you might know someone or reach out to someone who's majoring or who's planning on doing a career in finance or tech. Um, did you speak to those alumni as well? Or did you mostly focus on um, alumni who had the same experiences that you were hoping to get? To be honest, I like when I was approaching the alumni, I wasn't approaching it quite as much from specifically just the career standpoint. It really was more of the clubs because like I think like when you look at the clubs, at least I felt this way, that's like a really big kind of piece around what you want to how you want to craft your story. You want to say, oh, I want to get involved with this, this and this leadership position here, you know, what, whatever you want to say um, for X, Y, Z reasons. And you want to figure you want to be confident about those reasons. You want to be like, I know this club offers specifically this. I'll, I'll offer a more nuanced example that could potentially help. So I, I spoke with this gal and she talked to me about how this one specific club was very helpful as it relates to job preparation. They do a lot of peer resume review. Um, they, they do a lot of partnering with specific companies. She named a few um, examples to be specific. And she just talked about how the club functioned a lot more and how she specifically leveraged that for her own success. And so for me, that was something that was very, very, very helpful to not only be able to speak to the type of the club, but how I envisioned I would use that club based on how I know the club actually works. Like it just kind of adds that next layer um, that uh, I, I think can stand out um, in an application for sure. Awesome. So I think we've covered all the live comments. So we're coming to an end. Um, but, you know, kind of lastly, just would love to before we close out, kind of hear more about what you're most excited as you're, you know, kind of entering business school very soon. Is there something you're very much looking forward to? Um, or that you're planning to partake in like travel or anything like that? Anything exciting you'd like to share before we end the session today? Yeah, honestly, my the thing is, it's a little bit more high level. And, and that's just being around a lot of very, very highly motivated, just very kind of, you know, go getter type A individuals. Um, for me, I, I crave those types of environments. Um, and I'm, I'm very competitive. Um, but I would say in a good way where, you know, if everyone else is killing the game around me, I just want to rise to that level. And I would say that's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to pursue the MBA as well outside of my career goals is just how do I maximize my own personal potential? And I know the probability of that is going to increase if I'm surrounded by spectacular individuals pursuing all of these crazy things from a bunch of different countries as well. So um, that, you know, just that environment, honestly, is what I'm most excited for, for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mike. I hope everyone who's watching yeah. um, has found the session helpful. Definitely appreciate it. And congratulations and good luck. Thank you so much, Stacey. I appreciate it. And thanks everyone else for, for tuning in. Awesome. I'm going to end the broadcast. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. That's good. Bye, guys.